When managing the airway, A, the most dangerous complication of drug-assisted intubation is inability to obtain an adequate airway. B, hypotension is the quickest cause of death in trauma patients. C, a surgical cricothyroidotomy should not be done on kids less than 14 years of age. D, alternative definitive airways include nasotracheal tube and laryngeal tube airways. E, nasotracheal intubation should be performed if facial fractures are suspected. A is for airway and B is for breathing. In the chapter one review, I said that your goal was to maintain adequate end organ perfusion. But as you know, for perfusion to be adequate, what needs to be circulating is well oxygenated blood. So in short, you should add avoiding hypoxemia and hypercarbia to your goal of maintaining adequate perfusion. Hypoxemia is the quickest cause of death for trauma patients. That's why all trauma patients, even those that come in smiling and talking, get supplemental oxygen and pulse ox monitoring. So answer B is wrong. Let's go back to our patient from chapter one. Mechanism, 30 year old unrestrained male passenger involved in a head on collision with an 18 wheeler was ejected from the vehicle. One death at the scene. Injury, obvious deformity of left leg and large scalp laceration with active bleeding. Signs, heart rate 120, BP 98 over 60, respirations 30, GCS 7. Treatment, one IV running LR, a seat collar, backboard, an LMA, and a bandage of the scalp wound were placed at the scene. This patient already has an LMA placed, so you know he will need this replaced for a definitive airway, and you'll likely want to put an NG or OG tube down as well, depending on if facial fractures are present. For your exam, the definition of a definitive airway is a cuffed tube inserted and inflated below the vocal cords. In small kids, the standard has been an uncuffed tube, but newer atraumatic cuffs are now being used in infants as well. In this patient, if the LMA is functioning well and he is ventilating without difficulty, then replacing it is not gonna be your first step. And an NG tube is definitely not your first step. Your priority is what's going to kill him first. Evaluate his airway, and if it is stable for now, move on to the next thing that is gonna kill him. Once you're sure the patient has a patent airway, your next priority is to ensure adequate ventilation. Regarding airway, he has an LMA in place. Regarding breathing, he's tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 30. There are a number of injuries that could cause a life-threatening airway issue, like maxillofacial trauma with blood, swelling, secretions, loose teeth, etc., all trying to obstruct his airway. More complex injuries include neck trauma, both penetrating and blunt, with direct injury to the trachea or compression from a large hematoma and laryngeal injuries which may require surgical intervention to truly secure the airway. Also, injuries that should cause you to think about inadequate ventilation include severe pulmonary contusion, open pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, and massive hemothorax, which are both circulatory killers as well. Always keep the potential killers in the forefront of your mind as you're evaluating the patient. One of the major keys to airway management is your ability to recognize airway compromise early. From chapter one, remember the 10 second rapid assessment prior to the primary survey. Touch the patient, talk to the patient, and get a verbal response if possible. Likewise, speed and being thorough are your friends as you go through the primary survey. You want to rapidly assess each key area looking for life-threatening injuries that have to be addressed right away. 
You'll get to everything else in the secondary survey and definitive care. Your assessment starts with the airway. And some key things to assess rapidly are, is the patient tachypnic, hoarse, agitated or anxious? You should look, listen, and feel with each area that you check. Specific to airway and ventilation, that would include primarily the face, mouth, neck, and chest. Even in the abdomen, you might see abnormal, abdominal, or diaphragmatic breathing, with the abdomen being pushed out with inspiration. Again, look, listen, and feel with each area. Are there abnormal sounds, gurgling, snoring, strider, etc.? Are there dislodged teeth or other solid things in the mouth? Sweep them out or pull them out with a finger if needed. Is there blood or secretions pooled in the mouth or visible throat? Suction it out quickly. Is the trachea midline? Touch it. Is there sub-Q air, crepitus, or a palpable fracture? Is ventilation adequate? Again, look, listen, and feel. Evaluate chest rise, breath sounds, tachypnea, and oxygen saturation. Aspiration does kill. Remember, an NG tube does not guarantee that your patient won't vomit. Always be ready to suction and rotate the patient because vomiting can occur without warning. Don't forget C-spine precautions during airway management and make sure you say it on the practical exam. Airway management is not a one-man job. Your team must be present before the patient gets there. No yelling down the hall for help. And definitely memorize lemon. See page 28 and 29. Look for signs of a difficult intubation, obesity, spinal arthritis, small mouth, kids, short neck, etc. Evaluate the 332 rule. If less than 332, expect difficulty. That's three finger breaths between the incisors, three finger breaths between the hyoid bone and chin, two finger breaths between the thyroid notch and floor of the mouth. Review the Malampati classifications for the hypopharynx. If you can't seem to remember all the structures for Malampati, just focus on the uvula. In class one, you see the entire uvula with space below it. In class two, you see most or part of the uvula, but it looks like it's resting on the tongue. No space below. In class three, you see only the base of the uvula. And in class four, you can't see any part of the uvula. Only the hard palate is seen. Obstruction of the airway of any kind means difficulty. And neck mobility is always compromised in a trauma patient because of C-spine precautions. When you get to the hands-on skills portion of the ATLS certifying course, you'll review how to remove a helmet while maintaining C-spine protection. But if you have access to a cast cutter, use it. One person will maintain C-spine stability manually while another cuts the helmet and removes it. Take a good look at page 28 for more on how to assess a potentially difficult airway and you should have an airway protocol that you follow. Figure 2-4 on page 29 is an example of one. A glidescope or other video laryngoscope can be very helpful in these situations, but if you have a patient with a difficult airway, this should not be your first time using the glidescope. And not all hospitals have glidescopes available, so if you do have one available in your hospital, take some time and get familiar with it. Use it on your easy, straightforward intubations and get real comfortable with it. You must avoid nasal tubes when facial fractures are present. Yes, that includes NG tubes, nasopharyngeal airways, and nasotracheal intubation. If there's a black eye, nasal bleeding, blood coming out of the air, or anything else that makes you raise an eyebrow, you need to stay out of the nose. When do you need to intubate? That's a good question. Here are some of the common indications. Apneic or almost apneic patient. Respiratory distress, such as hypoxemia, hypercarbia, increased work of breathing, tachypnea, cyanosis. 
severely altered level of consciousness. Glasgow Coma Scale score of eight or less, consider intubation and severe combativeness not resolved with oxygen. Airway compromise or respiratory compromise from facial, neck, or chest wall injury. Persistent or refractory hypotension. Table 2-1 on page 33 has a summary of the indications for intubation. Here are some key points for intubation success. Protect the C-spine. Airway management is not a one-man job. It requires a team. One assistant will unfasten the C-collar and manually restrict C-spine motion. Your best airway manager should intubate. That's not necessarily the trauma team leader. Another assistant should be ventilating the patient and assisting the person intubating. Be prepared. Have your drugs ready. Test your laryngoscope light. Test your ET tube cuff for leaks, etc. Plan for failure. Assume all your intubation attempts will fail and have a clear rescue plan. Pre-oxygenate with high flow O2 before and re-oxygenate with high flow O2 after each attempt, preferably with a non-rebreather mask. Hold your breath during each attempt because when you need to breathe again, you know it's time to stop and oxygenate the patient. Ideally, your attempt shouldn't last longer than 30 seconds. And if the sats drop before that, stop and reoxygenate. Don't do any other procedures simultaneously with intubation. A useful mnemonic as you're preparing for intubation is soap me. Suction, oxygen, adjuncts, including your nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airways, as well as a bougie, video laryngoscope, LMA, etc. Pre-oxygenate, monitor meds or drugs, and equipment. In ATLS-10, rapid sequence intubation, or RSI, is now called drug-assisted intubation, DAI. A very common combination is etomidate, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram IV, plus succinylcholine, 1 milligram per kilogram, given consecutively in rapid sequence, typically over three to five seconds each. If you're comfortable with the drugs used during DAI, then fantastic. But if you're not, then by all means, call for some assistance. In addition to anesthesiology, in many hospitals, CRNAs and respiratory therapy will come to traumas and handle this part of the treatment. So if you have one of these options, take it. Otherwise, awake intubation, though not fun, can be done when necessary. Remember, when you're using DAI, never paralyze a patient without adequate sedation. Also remember that once your patient is paralyzed, they are unable to breathe spontaneously. If you are unable to secure the airway at this point, you must be able to ventilate the patient using the bag valve mask until paralysis wears off. This is the most dangerous complication of using sedation and paralytics, loss of spontaneous respirations without being able to secure the airway, making A the correct answer. Let me just say a quick word about airway adjuncts. Even though our focus is on endotracheal tubes, you do need to be at least familiar with extraglottic devices like LMAs, laryngeal mask airways, and LTAs, laryngeal tube airways. These are not definitive airways because they do not enter the trachea. In a trauma setting, these are used more frequently in the pre-hospital setting when laryngoscopy has failed. EMS is typically not going to have a glide scope available to help with visualization. However, even with poor visualization, you can use an extraglottic device to salvage one of these can't intubate, can't oxygenate situations. But this will buy you some time to oxygenate the patient until a definitive airway can be secured. Even if you don't expect to ever have to place one, 
you should review and get familiar with these devices. There's always that one in a million situation where you may have to replace one for a definitive airway. Oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways can be very helpful with back valve mask ventilation. And as I mentioned earlier, the gold standard for securing the airway is an endotracheal tube with an inflated cuff below the trachea. The exception to the rule is applied to small children where uncuffed tubes are used, but that is changing as well now that newer atraumatic tubes have been developed for children. So D would also be incorrect. A nasotracheal tube is an alternative definitive airway, but a laryngeal tube airway is not. Remember, if there are facial fractures, you would not use nasotracheal intubation. Thus, E is also wrong. When it comes to being prepared for a trauma patient, you need to be able to do a surgical airway. In the ATLS course, you practice surgical airways along with other skills, but the two-day course is not designed to make you proficient in the skill. So if you're standing next to your level one trauma center's world-class ENT surgeon who is in the neck all day long, don't push him or her out of the way and say, I got this. Get out of the way, watch and learn. But if in your critical care access facility, you are it and the buck stops with you, then you might wanna do some additional courses to get comfortable with these skills. And remember that contrary to popular belief, a well-placed, properly functioning needle cricothyroidotomy with jet ventilation will ventilate the patient sufficiently long enough for him to be transferred if used with an appropriate high pressure oxygen source of 15 liters per minute, 50 to 60 PSI, with an inspiratory to expiratory rate of one to three to one to four seconds. The needle crike can then be converted to a surgical crike using the Seldinger technique, threading a guide wire down the catheter. Remember that a surgical crike is not recommended for kids less than 12. In those kids, you'll need to do a needle crike if you cannot secure the airway by other means. So answer C is incorrect. Again, once you've established your airway, check it by listening to the lungs and stomach. Check O2 set and end tidal CO2. Get a chest x-ray and if it's not too difficult, put a gastric tube down. And if your patient deteriorates, go back and check his airway again. Again, don't be a dope is the mnemonic for deterioration in your intubated patient. Displacement, obstruction, positioning or pneumothorax, and equipment failure. Recheck everything, starting with the airway. If your intubated patient now has diminished breath sounds on the left, he may not have a pneumothorax. Instead, the tube may be in the right mainstem bronchus and just needs to be pulled back. Once again, Recheck everything.